Welcome to PC Games Nostalgia, where we talk about yesterday's PC games today. My name is Jimmy Wilhelmsson and I will be your host for the next 20 minutes or so. The title we're gonna probe into today is... I'm Duke Nukem and I'm coming to get the rest of you alien bastards. Hail to the king, baby. Each time we bring a guest from the gaming industry to our digital studio, and today's honored guest star is Mr. Mark Parker from The Bearded Ladies. Welcome, Mr. Parker. May I call you Mark, by the way? Uh, you can call me anything you like, Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have to, you have to apologize me for doing this, but has anyone ever called you Park Marker by accident? Uh, by accident? No, on purpose, plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is and, there a story uh, Mark, behind that? <laughs> uh, just, it's just nice having a name that's kind of the same first name, the same second name almost. So kids at school would call you Mark Parker, the car Parker, uh, Mark Parker, uh, Parker from Thunderbirds, Parker Pen, Parker Coat. There's a type of coat called a Parker. <laughs> yeah. And Parker, uh, you know, Nosy Parker. Oh. It, it never ends. Okay. Uh, this interview is going to be something special. I can feel that already. <laughs> you work at the, the Bearded Ladies. Uh, what, what, what is your job title? What are you doing there? Well, I'm the producer for the Bearded Ladies, and I also do a bit of the writing. I'm not the lead writer by any means, but I'm a support writer, I would say. Okay. And I'm also somewhat the studio manager, so I kind of buy the toilet paper and coffee for the office. Because I have to tell the viewers, me and Mark actually know each other because we used to work together uh, at a game that the Bearded, Bearded Ladies did a few years ago called Mutant Zero Road to Eden. Do you remember that time, Mark? It was Mutant Year Zero Road to Eden, Jimmy. Exactly. Um, but um, yeah, yeah those, were good, those were good days, if, if not a bit tough. My impression of you, Mark, was that you were all over the place. You were running around with your Excel sheets and you were telling everybody what to do. And I was sure, oh, he's going to be the studio manager. And he's like, no, I'm the, uh, and some kind of producer. I didn't even know what a producer did at, at a game studio, but I guess we will find out. <laughs> <laughs> we do everything the other team members don't want to do. Ah. All the boring shit, all the, sorry, all the boring stuff. But you haven't been with the Bearded Ladies forever. I mean, you used to work uh, in Copenhagen with the Hitman series before. Yeah, I worked at IO Interactive for nine years. Right. So I came uh, to Copenhagen from the UK in 2008. Okay. Uh, and I, I worked on um, Kane Lynch, uh, one and two, uh, and uh, Hitman Absolution and Hitman 2016 and Hitman 2, as they call it. Okay. So yeah, it was, uh, it was good. It was fun, good, uh, good bunch, IO. Uh, some some crazy ideas coming up in lunch meetings and stuff. Everybody's looking around for ways to murder people horribly. So that's kind of <laughs> one of the best things. It's like, oh, there's somebody lifting a piano up on the side of the building. Oh, that's an accident ready to happen. You know. We are here today to talk about a really old game. We're here to talk about Duke Nukem 3D. It's time to abort your whole friggin' species. <laughs> What is your uh, memories of Duke Nukem 3D? You're really old. You're an old geezer. I mean, you, you've been around forever. Duke Nukem oh, was released... Thank you. <laughs> it was released in January 96, if I remember correct. What was your situation back then? I was less studying, more partying in those days. Um, and just causing trouble in those days. Um, but yeah, I mean... It came out in it came out in '96. I got to play on it a little bit at university when people got hold of I think it was the shareware version, yeah. which was like a certain amount of maps. We would play it on the university machines because the university uh, had like a computer lab and it was open until like three in the morning every day. So it was perfect. We'd just go to the pub, go and play a bit of uh, of. of Duke Nukem or, or whatever, right? How would you describe Duke, Nuke, Duke Nukem 3D for anyone who's never played it or seen it? I would say it's kind of a an upgrade to Doom in a lot of ways. Yeah. Visually and gameplay-wise, it's far ahead of its uh, of its time. I would say a lot of interactive stuff. 
much interactivity. In between Doom 2 and Quake, there was Duke Nukem 3D from 3D Realms, uh, some new guys. I, I thought that Duke Nukem 3D gave the, um, the genre of FPS, first-person shooter games, some well-deserved competition. For sure. I mean, there was a lot of innovation in Duke Nukem 3D. There was a lot of cool weapons. Uh, there was all sorts of different little Easter eggs and secrets and fun stuff you could do. I mean, they made a game, I think 3D Realms made a game called Rise of the Triad, which came before Duke right. Nukem before, but they took it to the next level of Duke. And I think they continued that with a game afterwards called Shadow Warrior as right. well. A lot of interactivity. Damn, I'm looking good. Do I, do I remember it correctly when I say that in Doom and Doom 2, you could not jump? Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. Absolutely right. In, in, in Doom 1 and 2, yeah. You came to a window or whatever and you wanted to go inside there because you could see the red key, but there was no way to climb or jump the window. You could, you could sort of drop down and stuff, but exactly. that was about as far as it went. And then came Duke Nukem 3D with jetpacks and not only jumping, but you could also run and jump and do all kinds of stunts. And it was a melee attack. You could kick. Exactly. I suppose you could argue that in Doom 2 you had the chainsaw. On right. Top, but, right. Um, but you could kick people. It was quite fun in Duke because you could freeze people with the freeze ray and then you walk up and then finish them by kicking them and it would shatter into like a lot of little pieces. <laughs> um, so it's like fun stuff like that. It, it, it really... It was, it was quite a few years before I think anybody even matched that ingenuity right. of, 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 uh, you know, of weapons and features. Do you think that Duke Nukem uh, himself did have something to do with the popularity of the game? Well, absolutely. I think, what's the guy's name? John St. John? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think the characterization, it was the first time we really had, I mean, the Doom guy he doesn't say a word and Quake fellow whoever he's called, yeah. don't say anything. I mean, nowadays, Doom guys are kind of a bit more, they fleshed him out with some sort of backstory and some bit more uh, about him. But Duke Nukem was going around and cracking these one-liners all the time. Right. And that was, that, was, that was different, that was special. In multiplayer, you could press some of the F buttons and it'd be like, your face, your ass, what's the difference? And you'd be like, <laughs> this is great, right? <laughs> there is, there is. There are actually, everybody remembers the old, uh, the old uh, Roddy Piper uh, quote from the movie They Live. Uh, it's time to kick ass and chew gum, and I know I'm all out of gum. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of gum. But I love the, the ending of, you, you told me that you played the, the shareware version first, and the shareware version had the first level, the, the first full level. You, you could play pretty long without yeah. paying. And towards the end of that, he says before he meets the, uh, the middle boss or whatever, I'm going to rip off your throat. Yeah, I'm going to rip off your head and shit down your throat. And he kills the boss and then he does it. That's, that's like, a, we can't show you that because it's, you know, it's, it's not 1996 <laughs> anymore. I'll rip your head off and shit down your neck. Yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff, it was... When you're playing online with friends or, or, or a network meetup or something, and you can just press that and just like constantly insult your friends, it was a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, the shareware version was was cool. We played it to death, but I think I only really got the full game a year or so later when I got a really crummy PC for my for my birthday, <laughs> and it was it didn't run anything else but the older games. <laughs> so Duke was the one I, I was playing the most on that, of right. that machine. Because I, I could play it at a decent lick and, you know, the best settings and whatnot. How did you, because there was some issues, if I remember correctly, with Duke Nukem. You could not just connect it to any online service. How, how did that work? I actually personally never really played a lot of Duke online. Okay. The only time I really played it online was uh, that I used to play it with my friend Dave. And we had these, uh, we had the same cable company. And they had a deal where you could phone like peer-to-peer, modem-to-modem connection. And you could phone up um, each other and the connecting uh, price of 10 pence, that was all you paid for the duration of the call. So then what I would do, I would call up Dave and we would play for like seven hours on of like versus Duke Nukem. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and co-op are not the hardest difficulty. 
uh, we would do that. But then I would have friends round once in a while and we would have our network meeting. Yeah. Uh, which would be maybe two days, like a weekend or something. And then we would play a lot of that. We spent the first day trying to get the network adapters working. They always didn't work. And it, there was always one person who couldn't get the driver installed or, I mean, these were the days where hardware really, really didn't want to work with each other. I played Duke Nukem, not online, but with a zero modem cable between two computers because I was going, I was living with my parents. I, I had moved from home, but I was living with my parents for a couple of days. So I brought my computer there and I have a, a smaller brother, a little brother who also had a computer. So we played hours and hours Duke Nukem in the same room, uh, just preparing traps for each other. Laser trip mines. It was all about laser trip mines. When we did the multiplayer, there was the, I, I can't remember which mission it was, but there was a big kitchen in it. Yeah. One of the first maps. And you could put like a laser trick mine and then you could crouch down and put another one behind a door. And then what would happen is somebody, someone would open the door Ooh, and it would explode. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like putting the, it was like putting the, the little mines, the proximity mines in the places uh, in the facility in GoldenEye. It's like that <laughs> kind of, that satisfaction. Um, the other thing I used to love doing was was um, there's these there's strippers, a little bit out of date now. I don't think people are gonna, I mean, you'd never do the same thing again in no. games. In those days, they got away with quite a lot. Yeah. And there was these, these, these dancing girls and you could go up to them and go, shake it, baby, and, and, and hold some, some dollar notes out. But I always put like a pipe bomb next to, to them. <laughs> and there would be these cameras you could watch, like the cameras would be moving around. Like this. And I would have a pipe bomb. I, could, I knew my friend would go up. He would go up and, uh, or one of my friends would go up and go shake it because they couldn't resist. Just <laughs> stupid. Um, and then I just press the button and you see the camera just this, this slight white noise. And you'd be like, yeah, that was, a, that was a, always a laugh. And it always got them. Just if you haven't played Duke Nukem 3D, there was a feature where you could watch. There were surveillance cameras all over the place. And from certain um, consoles, you could watch uh, the footage of those uh, surveillance cameras. So you could actually put a trip bomb or whatever somewhere, go to the console, write to someone, let's meet in the pool room or whatever. And then they came there and you just press, press the button and the whole thing explodes. And of course the camera also, that's why the monitor went, <laughs> went all gray. Yeah, that was fun with the camera. You could, it, was a, it was a flag in one of the any settings that you could make it destructible. I used to like doing that because I always knew somebody would be up there peeping at me so I could just shoot them out or whatever. Yeah. I mean, in that little room where the stripper was, I remember there's a TV and it had this video loop of like a video footage of a Ford Bronco. Uh, I think it was OJ's chase sequence that, that was there on like a little video loop in the bar TV. <laughs> Speaking about Easter eggs in Duke Nukem 3D, do you remember any more of those? Oh, there was loads. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could find the Doom Marine, and then Duke would be like, that's one doomed Marine. Mm, that's one doomed Space Marine. Right. And you could also find, I think, Lara Croft, and I think there might have even been Indiana Jones skeleton somewhere, one of the maps. You definitely, you meet Indiana Jones, where Duke says, we meet again, Dr. Jones. It again, Dr. Jones. Yeah, it was like a skeleton with the, with the Indiana Jones whip and, and, and hat. The Something like that. He's, he's like impaled or on a, on a stake or, or, or whatever. Yes. And then there was also, you could go to the microphone. This is an easy one. You can go to the microphone and he would go, Born to be wild. Born to be wild. They need Easter eggs. At least one. At least a little one. Um, because that shows that the team really want to have a bit of fun with what they're doing. They, they're not just doing the bare minimum. So let me ask you this. As a game developer, um, growing up with Easter eggs in your favorite games when you were a kid, how does that work? Do you write Easter eggs towards the end of the game when everything is done? Does anybody, everybody in the team, can they like chip in and, and come with suggestions? How do you at the Bearded Ladies work with Easter eggs? And in Mutant, the, there was an Easter egg, which we call the bush mags. Um, and I let people look, Google that and figure out what bush mags are. Oh. A, it's a bit of a phenomena from, from the eighties, I would say, and maybe yeah. the nineties too. Um, and Lee and David, they could constantly tease me about, oh, there's bush mags in there. I was like, I'm not looking for, what, what am I going to be looking for them for? What? And I think they put it in late in the day. <laughs> and then, 
And then, of course, I found out it was real after some time. And then we patched in for the Seed of Evil. We recorded some more lines for the Elder. So I wrote some lines where you've retrieved the Bushmags and then the Elder. I wrote these lines where he's, he's like, oh, I think you uh, have to leave me with these for some further study. Uh, close the <laughs> door on your way out. <laughs> Seed of Evil is the DLC of Mutant Year Zero, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's right. Just to be very, very clear for those of you who haven't, uh, who, who didn't come here for Mutant Year Zero, but came here for Duke Nukem. But you should buy Mutant Year Zero, by the way. You should buy it. Have you played Duke Nukem 3D recently? Um, no, I haven't. But I've been playing uh, Ion Ion Fury. Okay. Which is uh, a game, a spiritual sequel to Duke Nukem 3D. Okay. Um, I did play Duke Nukem Forever, actually, on the PlayStation uh, 3, I think. Right, but that's a different game. Yeah. Uh, but Iron Fury is very much like Duke Nukem 3D. It, the same engine, well, for some minor upgrades, I guess. And it runs on current gen, so you've got quite a lot of size and, and complexity to the levels. Right. But no, that's the last sort of time I played that engine. I mean, the last time I actually played Duke Nukem 3D actually probably was on a phone. Now, I'm not a great fan of mobile games, but it was just impressive that I had a Windows phone that could play Duke Nukem 3D on it right. years and years ago. So, I honestly, I can never beat the end boss on the football field, the American football field, without cheating. But, but I, I, I can reach that level and never, I can never beat him. But, but um, I did that on the Vita and it was nice. It was, I, I still think it's a great game. Yeah, I mean, I liked Duke Nukem 3D at the time. And I still refer to it a lot when we talk about game design. I think... Um, when we made, uh, we just made a game called Corruption 2029, yes. and that came out on the Epic Store. It's currently exclusive there, um, so it's available to buy now. Um, and that's uh, kind of an evolution of the gameplay that we introduced in Mutant Year Zero. Um, but one thing we had in mind was some Duke Nukem kind of weapons, and. You know, it's, it's very hard to come up with completely unique ideas. Most things have been touched upon, or at least done, or whatever previous. We, not really many people can come and say, I've got a completely unique idea. We're going to make a game based upon. Because it, if it's completely unique, it's probably something other people have decided against because it was crap. Right. Right. Uh, one thing we want to do, we remembered the Holoduke from Duke Nukem. Okay, so, was, so tell, what is the Holoduke? Tell the... Well, it was like a, like a Frisbee. You chuck down... And then a Duke Nukem would like materialize and they would just stand there firing like this. And I used to love doing that. I used to go into a room in the, in the game and it'd be like- It's a like, decoy like, oh. sort of. Yeah, a decoy, exactly. Yeah. Four other players would be there. They'd be fighting. I can turn the light switch off in that room. It's quite funny. <laughs> they'd be like, oh, oh, turn the light off. Um, and then you chuck the, Duke, the Holoduke in and they'd be shooting the Holoduke. And while they're doing that, they're shooting each other and then you just go in and mop up the rest. Well, in Corruption, we wanted to add that function. So we actually have a, 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 um, a hollow duke equivalent, uh, like a decoy, a hollow decoy. Um, and actually, they shoot and they say some stuff. They say, hey, arsehole or something. And then they, they, will, they will die when they get hit a certain number of times. Um, but that's all very much inspired from Jim Newton, from the hollow duke. Do you remember any anything that was really bad? I mean, uh, any 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 uh, annoying bug or anything else that is not so um, uh, worthy to remember? I don't know what I'm after here, but if there is something that you feel like, I wish they hadn't done this. Well, I, I kind of didn't like it when you. I mean, I like mouse look. Oh yeah. And I remember, you know, like in games like Quake, the first Quake, I play online. Or on, or on a network meeting and no one used mouse look in those days everyone's just like a, a turret they're going like this all the time and i used to use mouse look i used to have to tape down a button i think i used to set it to the, the right control and i'd tape it down yeah so because it was no toggle it was just like either you had to hold you had to hold it down and do it or not so i'd tape it down so i could use it all the time and i would jump on people's heads and i would just shoot them in the top of the head while they're just doing this <laughs> and, and and it was brilliant <laughs> idiots um but in Duke, as soon as you looked up and down, the world went all kind of janky. Yeah. And it was like, it was, it was, I wanted to use it, but I couldn't. I think that was just a limit of the engine. I don't think it's the game's fault. And that's why it was never a default option. Duke Nukem 3D was the very last game 
FPS game that I played solely on, on my keyboard. I never used the mouse. I moved uh, back and, uh, uh, and forth uh, with the uh, cursor keys. And I think I strafed with the right and left key, and then I had uh, looked up and down uh, with the um, with some uh, character combination, and I shot with control. I think that yeah. w was that the default. I, I think it probably was the default. I, it's hard to remember, uh, yeah. Jimmy. I, I, it was just such a long time ago. I just remember. I know that the game kind of has an, uh, an auto aim. Right. So as long as you sort of shoot anything that's kind of in like a, 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 a you know, a, a, a vertical line. Right. You can hit it. So right. there's a guy on top of like a, a, a building there and you aim here. It's going to hit that guy. <laughs> that's basically what happens. Do we have a question for the creators of Duke Nukem 3D, like George Broussard or, or anyone else that we can call and ask them? Do you have a question uh, about why did you do this and why didn't you do that or whatever? So what I would say is, why did you wait so long before making the next Duke Nukem? Because they could have just used the existing engine and, and that might have been a bit of a cash in, but I think people would have appreciated it. Game over. Mark, it's been a wonderful thing having you here and talking old memories about Duke Nukem 3D. I would like to thank you for coming here uh, to our digital studio and sharing with us the uh, fond memories and some updates about what you're doing at the Bearded Ladies. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Jimmy, and uh, we'll see you again soon next time in Malmo. <laughs> we <Yeah>? will. <laughs> we'll have a beer. All right. <laughs> okay. See you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.